invitation. Um, just checking that you can uh, see the same screen as me. So hopefully the blue uh, open information uh, thing with my name on. Just to check yes. that. Yes, great. You can see that I've not used the uh, technology before. Uh, and I was thinking, uh, as you introduced the panelists, that it, uh, one of the interesting aspects of the project for me is that it's cross-functional. So uh, I'm from the finance function in uh, Oxfam, Great Britain. Um, but we heard that uh, uh, the colleagues on the panel are from you know, policy or from technical backgrounds. So it's really interesting uh, um, for me just which... Uh, how we have to work across functions on this issue, and probably to explain that I'm definitely not from a technical background, so uh, if that's what you're hoping for, just to manage expectations at this point. So what I'm planning to do is just, uh, I've got um, a small number of slides, and I'm just going to give a quick overview of what Oxfam Great Britain has done in the last year on open information. Um, now let me try to... Uh, go to my next slide. Uh, so, ha, huh, there we go. So this is um, this just relates to Oxfam Great Britain's open information policy. So what I think is really important here is although there are various donor requirements, uh, certainly in Europe and specifically in the UK, I think it's really important that we come back to why we are doing this at all. And for me and for Oxfam, it's defined by what the program needs. So we believe uh, you know, that transparency and accountability will make us into a better organization and will help us develop better programs. So that's why we have our open information policy, which you can see an extract of uh, here. Um, and um, that's what leads us to uh, having a general approach of transparency, but specifically to uh, publish in IRT format. And for me, that's uh, a much better starting point, both in terms of justifying any resources, but also in terms of convincing people internally to get excited about this. It's, uh, you know, it's, I think it's really important to come back to the kind of program uh, benefits uh, that are possible through doing this. Um, let me, yes, it works. So this is what has happened so far in Oxfam. Um, so in November last year, so still fairly recently, we published our first set of data uh, for basically all our Oxfam GB projects. So this is uh, a uh, a set of all of our projects, and it's a fairly limited set of data, but it includes financials, uh, location, a short description of what we're trying to do, and that's up to our kind of end of financial year 2010-11. So that's kind of live on our website and on the IRT registry. In terms of the project, it was, I guess, I would characterize it as a small but significant project. So it certainly wasn't trivial, but um, again, it wasn't many people working many weeks to do it, so it was kind of uh, it was definitely what we class as a small project, but also uh, significant. We also, as well as publishing in XML, we also published in Excel just to make the data as accessible as possible. Some of the issues we faced were inevitably in doing it for the first time. Um, every stage was a learning process. So it definitely took longer than we were expecting. And there were more issues that came up as we learned along the way. So one example of that was just the uh, registry with IRT itself. Whereas I'd imagine that was a very trivial process, it turned out to be something that took a number of hours to do. So there was a number of those type of issues that as we went through the process, things just took a bit longer than we were expecting. Um, the, one of the main risks, and I'll come to the risks uh, in a couple of slides time, was around how we make sure that none of the information harms either our staff or beneficiary. And there was definitely, although the process was a systematic one in the sense we extracted data from the system, there was definitely manual intervention we needed to do uh, during the first time to exclude the 
highly sensitive project, and that took longer again than we were expecting. So then the technical aspects, which, as I explained at the start, I'm not completely uh, conversant with, they were definitely, uh, again, one step more challenging than we were expecting. So both in terms of how you convert the, the data to XML, but then also how you tag the data and map those fields were both processes that we had to spend relatively more resources on than others, than we were expecting. But on the other hand, a couple of other risks that we had highlighted before the project started. One was around the amount of resources we would need to respond to queries or the reputational damage we might face if some of the data was taken out of context. Um, so we, we've we had uh, downloads in the many hundreds. We don't have a precise number, but uh, we've not had one either query or inquiry uh, about or kind of press story about the information we've published in itself. So we've had lots of uh, publicity within the sector around um, the fact that we've done it, but there hasn't been any kind of uh, you know, story about what the content of the data we've produced. Let me carry on to slide four. So what we're planning to do, so um, as I mentioned at the start, the, uh, the requirement of the UK government or DFID is that we start publishing more information and more regularly. So by April 2013, we will need to uh, produce quarterly a larger set of data than we have currently got. So now there's a project underway to meet that deadline. Um, because the process will be a quarterly one rather than an annual one, it will need to be more systems driven. Also, one of the sets of data that the DFID are asking us to share is what they're calling project documents, which uh, is currently uh, slightly undefined, but will include things such as project evaluations. So there's a whole uh, communication piece that we need to do with our program staff around how the data that they're inputting into our systems will be used and viewed externally. So there's a whole uh, kind of non-technical side of the project, which is about communications and about writing style and making sure that people realize where their information will end up. Um, so as well as the kind of IRT uh, open information, we're also um, trying to share as much of uh, other information as possible. So, for example, on what we call our policy and practice website, um, we have a whole list of evaluations uh, from the last few years. So this is definitely just one strand of our open information work. Let me end with this. So these were the risks and the opportunities that we had highlighted at the start. So I've mentioned the first risk, the risk of beneficiary staff uh, or program delivery in sharing inappropriate information. And definitely that for me is the key risk and one that as we move to sharing more data and more regularly becomes uh, more alive. Um, and then you'll see those other two risks that I refer to. One is that information publishers interpreted wrongly out of context or that efforts is <coughs> excuse me, diverted because we are responding to queries. That's not happened so far. That's of course not to say it won't happen, um, but that's not been our experience. And I guess in a way having the data out there or being more open with um, the information is also protection against things being taken out of context in the sense that you can point people to the fact that we've been publishing much of this data for a long time. So that's on the risks. On the opportunities, um, just coming back to the point I was making at the start, for Optram, this is important not because of IRT, but because of the more general context and transparency and accountability. So if we can use it to promote that agenda, that is uh, that's really key for us. Um, I guess we're in a good place in terms of the, the, the development in the sector. So um, because we're all still at the early stages of how this is being implemented, we can at the moment influence how the um, how the implementation is taken forward. So uh, that's also a key opportunity for us. Um, and 
obviously it's opportunities for regional country and project level transparency so as well as uh, you know the way that I often conceptualize how people will use this data which is people in Western countries maybe uh, crunching the data there's also the opportunity both at country and project level for people to use this data further there is um, one issue we found at the moment is the data is still fairly inaccessible so uh, there's not that many ways to view the data so there's one site which is called uh, which you may know of, called aview.net, which enables you to start visualizing some of the data that's already there. And already you can see that if we get to a critical mass, that this data will be useful not only at a country level, but also within our programs as well. So, for example, if you want to know what programs are working in a particular country, that gives a very easy way to, um, uh, to look at that. So, let me stop there. Um, uh, yeah, that's our experience so far, uh, and the point just to emphasize is just coming back to uh, doing it further uh, to benefit and improve our programs. Great. Thanks very much, Paul. Um, and I just, in case uh, those on the, those joining the webinar aren't familiar with some, some of the things you mentioned, um, the Yachty registry that Paul mentioned is where all the Yachty data is posted, or basically everyone who's publishing Yachty data is should post it on their website, but then the Yachty registry is it's a place where the links to that data um, are are put so that you have one central place to access all the Yachty data available. Um, Paul also talked about converting data to XML. Um, the Yachty standard, in addition to defining what information should be made public, also um, created a, a standard determining what format that data should be published in, and that's XML, which is a machine-readable format to make it easier um, to automatically combine the data. Um, so just, just wanted to mention those two things um, before I turn it over to, to Craig. So thanks again, Paul. Craig, did you, oops, sorry, Craig, go ahead. Craig, you might be on mute on your end. Okay. There we Can go. Can you hear me now, everyone? Yes. Um, I wanted to thank everyone. Okay, great. I want to thank everyone again for um, to Laya and Interaction to having T Transparency International present on experience. Um, I also want to thank Paul for going first because it makes it a little easier to to cover some of the issues and having Laya um, go through the the language that we're all you get a little bit too close to the XML and the registry. So it's really helpful to kind of put that on the table before I go into our presentation. What I'm going to try to do is go through what the experiences of Transparency International has been on this. And this is going to focus on the Secretariat. So this is the organization that's um, what we call our Secretariat, which is in Berlin. And for some of you on the call, you might be facing a similar situation the way your organization is structured. That you have different governance units uh, that are separately financially and um, administratively from others. And that's how Transparency International is structured. So we have over 100 about 100 chapters around the world in different countries, but they all, well, they have governance requirements. They're all administratively um, and financially separate from us. So this is also creates an interesting dynamic for us when we think about how we extend IATI, IATI to, to all of our operations. Um, I just want to kind of go through quickly um, about some of the opportunities that we saw um, for TI. And some of these might be things that your own organization, Paul has mentioned this already about with Oxfam, how they saw it fitting with their disclosure policy and their broader issues about transparency. Um, and for us, for Transparency International, it, this is something that is part and parcel of our work. So when the opportunity came about to be able to report uh, using this common standard, we were very excited about it. Um, Transparency International, along with a couple other NGOs, had been part of the original steering committee that was put together for IATI 
um, to discuss how it was going to apply to donors. And then as it went through the discussions and then there was a change largely precipitated, um, as Laya mentioned, that there was already some initiatives from different NGOs that decided to apply the standard to their operations. But it was also um, through DFID's um, decision as a donor to make sure that their, the organizations that were receiving certain types of funding from them were in compliance with the standard to help them better understand where the money was going and the citizens to understand where DFID's money was going. This helped to expand the operations um, of how many different organizations are now part of it. But for, for TI, the way we saw also it was something that was fitting, and this is something that other organizations like Paul mentioned already, well, you'll find that it's relevant to where your disclosure policy is or where you've also met up with other accountability initiatives. For example, TI is part of the NGO Accountability Charter. Um, we also have been complying in terms of broader, um, I guess, accountability issues with our, um, in terms of international financial reporting standards that we've been using for our, our verifying our accounts. Um, and we also have brought in ourselves, our operations, into the Global Reporting Initiative Standard for NGO reporting to provide greater details, a level of information of our operations. So for us, this was sort of a, a natural next step. Um, and some of the points are on the presentation that you see here about how we fit, felt it fitting with our disclosure um, and all broader transparency. Um, and this is also visible through, we just done a, a site relaunch about two weeks ago, and we've decided to put all our information um, to an accountability section. So here you'll find, you'll see the screenshot there from our website, but you'll find not only information on how our governance structure is set up, but also all our financial statements that have been, as I mentioned, are certified through IFRS, um, also about our ethics policies, and past evaluations. So similar to what Oxfam has done where they put their evaluations online, we've also put our evaluations online, and we plan to put our project documents up shortly um, through this. But through the this section on accountability, you'll be able to, to see different, um, find different information that goes beyond the pure financial reporting that's being done through the standard of um, IATI. So as to go back to the point that this is something that's more of a comprehensive approach to how we as an organization are more transparent and accountable, and IATI is one of those components. Um, so for us, when, with the opportunities um, also create challenges, and, and Paul did a really good slide about talking about some of the risks and benefits. Um, but for us, when we were thinking about IET, and I think some of you, you know, might be thinking of this as well, is that I want to go back to a point that I mentioned that this standard was originally developed for donors. So when the categories were, were thought about, it, it came about through, a, through an approach that was looking at what is most relevant for donor operations. And in the process now, what is happening um, is to understand, well, how does the standard then translate to other types of, of development actors? So if it's foundations, or if it's us as NGOs, or if it goes into the private sector, or, or even thinking about how this might apply to new forms of climate financing um, and funds, it's, it's, it's something that we have to think about how these different categories match up. Um, and for us, it was thinking about, well, how do we, how do we make this information useful and meaningful when a lot of it's just going to be at the project level and might not capture all of our operations. Because as I mentioned, this in, the way that uh, TI has signed on is it's for the secretariat. Um, and so this is something that a lot of our information that would show is not going to get down to, let's say, a country level of what's happening in a country because of the way that we're, our, our chapters are operationally and financially distinct. Um, Another point was looking at how it aligned with our, our broader structures of governance. And I mentioned this a little bit of how we saw this as an opportunity, um, but also it's a challenge because of that we are governance, this governance structure that we are have these separate chapters that have a division between the financials um, and their own reporting process. Um, another one is looking at our nature of our work. So Transparency International is a little different from maybe some other development NGOs and that a large part of our work is related not so much to, to uh, kind of a project delivery such as an initiative on health and education, but more about advocacy and research and outreach. And so there's, it's a less tangible end product, which is what the original standard was designed about, following the money from, the, from a, a donor's budget down to a project level deliverable. And this is something that we had to think about when we were, think, when we were discussing the IATI standard. 
The other one is our, our constraints about resources, meaning human resources. So um, the Secretariat, we have 13 finance staff and then two governance advisors, which think about how the structure of our chapters, but also how we're meeting on international uh, um, obligations. As I mentioned, we're a member of the NGO Accountability Charter and then also with the Global Reporting Initiative. Um, and also, we have a very limited IT team. We have about two people full time um, that are working on our IT. And so, um, as we mentioned at the beginning, uh, Paul highlighted that we have, we have different people speaking today in the webinar. One thing that's interesting is that you see that we're from different backgrounds. And for IATI to be successful, one thing that we've learned in our own operations, but also from donors, is it really needs to be a, a cross functional team of having different people from different departments. And so this also created something that we had to think about. Last one was about the nature of our projects. I highlight this a little bit, but um, our budget's 24 million euro annually. So let's say it's about um, close to 30, a little over 30 million, uh, per 30 million US dollars a year. And we have 70 projects that we're running. So in terms of other organizations such as Oxfam GB or, or maybe your own operations, we're not a, a large, um, international NGO that's running operations around the world, a lot of it because of the way that we're structured with this chapter, going back to the chapters. Um, and a lot of our work is multi-country or at the global level. So we don't really have so much specific country um, level projects that go from one donor fund directly to a country. Um, so with this in mind, we, we, launched, um, our, we launched our adhesion to IATI. And I'm going to take you now through a little bit about what we've done to explain. So um, the current state. So as I mentioned, this is just applicable to the secretary, and we have a total of 31 donors. Right now, because we are, even though we are a global organization, we have um, a, a grant that's similar to what UK NGOs get from DFID. So as part of this grant obligation, we also have to report. So our, our priority of reporting was to get the information out on our projects from DFID. Um, and this was um, the first phase of our work, and it covers about about one fourth of our portfolio. So it's about six and a half billion. I'm sorry, six and a half million euros. Um, the idea is that we're going to apply the, I, the IETI standard to all our projects by January 2014. Um, what's important to note, which is interesting, and and um, Oxfam didn't talk about it so much, and I'd be interested to hear from them in the, in the discussion is for us we see this as an economies of scale so basically once we've got IATI in place and it's in the reporting system expanding this to other donor um, flows is not going to be that much of a cost so for us we see the natural jump moving it to all of our operations um, and this um, is something that um, that I would like to hear from the others I think it's an important point but we see it as really economies of scale that we can gain from um, we're basically talking about in our first publishing of data from BIFID, um, it's going to include one trust fund, which is multi-country, two countries, Vietnam and Malawi, and then a project that is um, a research project, which is a, a survey that we do on corruption. And that'll be included, these projects. We basically have five staff members working on this, including myself, but the bulk of the work is being done in terms of the nitty gritty from our financial team. Um, and as I mentioned, we saw this fitting into our broader institutional policies. So where is our implementation schedule at right now? OK, well, we've drafted. We have our implementation schedule. So basically, as an IATI signatory, you have an obligation to put together. There's a, um, a template that has been used for an implementation schedule originally done for donors. And we submitted that. And we put out our first batch of data. Um, it's been um, shared with there's a secretariat that's set up to deal with um, donors and different development actors that are reporting using the IATI standard. And they've about looked through our data, gave us some comments back, vetted it, and now we have to upload and submit it by the end of May, these changes. Um, this, as I mentioned by um, Leah, that this, di this data will be available through the IATI registry. So um, it'll be put up there. And the other thing is we're planning to report on a quarterly basis and then update this um, with any changes that have been made on past data as well as include new entries. Um, and then this would be as soon as a contract is signed officially, then we're going to upload this, this information. Um, and this is, again, would be in a phased out process. So right now, we're looking at only DFID data. And then by January 2014, we would include all our projects for all the owners um, or from any sort of resource. 
um, the process that we've had, it's been semi-manual, semi-automated. And this is because we um, were caught in a situation that some of you might find yourself in, is that we were uploading our data as we, we, we adapted the IATI standard, which includes a financial component of reporting, as we were changing our financial systems. So we moved from an, uh, our financial systems, which has been about a, a one and a half year process, which will, should be completed by uh, December 2013, when we would be then able to fully automate all our processes. So as soon as something enters into our financial system, we'd be able to also simultaneously update this through the on a quarterly basis, though, but update it um, without much process to the IATI. Um, and some of the current outcomes. So. These are things I mentioned a little bit before that we are, um, are we have sort of no data exclusions, um, but because of the way that we're, our current open, um, sorry, our access to information policy, so we have no data exclusion right now, and we have um, the, made the decision that we're not publishing our historical data. So any project that was active as of April 2012 will be reported. Anything that had been closed, and even if it had closed in, let's say, March 31, 2012, it will not be reported. So we're going, we're going current and forward projects. Um, our licensing, we had a discussion about this. We decided to do um, what's called an open data commons um, attribution license, which means that people that use our data can use it openly, but they have to, they have to credit the fact that it's TI's data. Um, and we're putting this all through the registry. We are not putting right now anything on our website about um, the, data, the data files will all be made through the registry, and we're not planning to have a visualization tool. This, some, this is something we might do more um, in advance as we go forward, as we have uh, more than uh, our projects are added to the to that we have over you know all our projects covered by 2014. But right now, we're not expecting any um, having a visualization tool, just because it's such a small part of our portfolio. It's, it's 25 right now of our flows that we thought that it wasn't going to be useful and that it's better to bring this into other data visualization tools which are being um, piloted as, as Paul has mentioned. Um, so just to kind of wrap up, the constraints are basically related to data. This is what I signaled before. Um, it has to do with the fact that the IATI standard was made originally and agreed to by donors. So some of the stuff just doesn't apply. We don't have forward budgets at TI. We don't plan um, Except for projects, we do not have our, our core what we say, core funding more than for one year out. So we can't. It's very hard for us to report on forward budgets. Um, I mentioned this idea of the ch our chapters being independent, so we're not capturing their data right now. This is something that we need to discuss going forward in terms of. But it would affect a change in our governance bylaws if we were to um, have all our chapters report their data as well through IATI standard. Um, right now, some are, um, the chapter in the UK is planning to report. And there's other chapters that are thinking about how to do it. Right now, it's a question of the, op the obstacles that they see because of the, the small size of their operations. Um, but then this is, again, something that there's been a lot of work by the secretary that's set up on IATI to come up with some solutions and platforms that can be used for smaller NGOs. Um, and then some non-applicable fields that we just found that are not, that just don't make sense. We don't, have, we don't capture conditionalities, so we can't report on them. Um, and then some things we don't capture, which is we don't capture a thematic um, set focus sector for our work. So with that, um, I want to thank you. Here are some contacts um, from our finance team. This uh, Gustavo Arnado, he's the one who's lead it, uh, led all the process and updates. And then my, myself and then my colleague Stan Kutzak, who works on governance issues. So thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thanks, Craig. Um, so I think our two presentations so far have brought up a, a lot of issues. Um, so hopefully you all have a lot of questions. I just wanted to, to flag a few. Um, one, Yadi seems to be only part of these organizations' transparency efforts, so it's not the only thing organizations are doing in terms of transparency. Um, Yadi does require an internal shift, so um, people need to be aware, as Paul said, of where their data is going to end up as, as organizations become more open. Um, there is a question, a question of, of what Yadi will apply to um, has been around for, for a while in terms of NGOs publishing. It, are NGOs only going to publish on the funding they get from official donors, or will they extend that to cover um, the, the funding that they're raising from private sources as well? Um, 
then there's the issue that the that the standard, though it's flexible, it was originally designed with donors in mind, so there is some adaptation that needs to happen to make it more applicable to NGOs. Um, and then there is, you know, the, the data, Yadi data is still fairly inaccessible, um, and so there it does need to be more attention paid to what tools can be developed to really bring this, this data to life. So those are just some of the um, the issues that I flagged, but uh, hopefully you all have questions. And um, just, a, just a reminder of how you can do that. Um, if you have a question, you can either raise your hand or type it in the question box. So any questions for our, our panelists so far? And remember that you are on on mute. So I might, um, if you, I'm going to go through and try to, well, no, we'll get echoes that way. So you will have to raise your hand or, or type a question in. Um, so here we have um, the first question. Uh, and, and I'll just pose it to you all. So actual or future budgets as well. Um, what level of geographic detail are you providing information? Just at the country level or below the country level? Um, and what level of financial detail? Is each project expenditure broken down further or just reported at the project level? So details in terms of geographic information and financial data. And then another question, which I perhaps could take, um, is DFID the only donor pushing for NGOs to, to use Yachty? So Paul or Craig, do, do you want to take the first question? Uh, um, this is Paul, yeah, I, I don't mind, uh, or Craig, if you want to go first. Let, let me go, let me go. Mm -hmm. So just on the question around, uh, so there's a couple of questions, I think, on the financial uh, information that we're sharing. So we are just sharing total budgets for the project. So we're not breaking them down further uh, by category and certainly not by transaction or anything like that. And the information that we're sharing is both historic expenditure and future budget. So you'll get a sense of the whole size of the pro project and that's broken down through uh, the different years. On the second point around the geography, so we have at least country level geography for all our projects. For many of our projects, we have further data, so even down to kind of GPS references, but that's inconsistent. But for most of the other projects, we'd either have kind of, uh, you know, sub-regional level or uh, town information. So we've got two, uh, two geography fields. One is country, and other is kind of uh, more information if we have it. Great. Craig, do you have anything to add? Sure. Um, from our side, okay, so basically we're just doing the same thing as, um, as Oxfam that we're reporting at the project activity. That's our activity level. So the way that, not to get too technical, but um, IATI standard, the categories are based on activities, and you define your activity in different ways. And so we've, def I mean, you would work on defining the activity in a way that's meaningful. So our activities are divided, are divided by projects, um, as Oxfam is. And we, as I mentioned, that we're looking at projects that are current and then going forward. So we are able to pro we're able to report nominal forward budgets if it's a multi-year project, um, but we're not able. What I was saying was, is when we go fully compliant, and I and I've heard from Paul that they've reporting now they're reporting for all donors. Um, but for us right now, since we're still rolling this out, when we do report, we're not going to be able. We'll have a challenge reporting our total organizational budget forward because we don't do that, but for a project level, we could. Um, in terms of geographic data, we're reporting at the regional to the, and the country level. A lot of this has to do with the fact that, as I mentioned, by our, our way we're structured and the projects that we're running, we don't go beyond that level. Um, what would be interesting is when our chapters, um, if our chapter was to, to adopt the standard, then that would be reporting much more at a would be reporting at the country level and then down further. But for us, we stop at the country level, and that's also 
what's been agreed with as part of this reporting structure with DFID. Now, whether other donors are mandating it, um, there was a lot of discussion in the last year, um, right after DFID made the decision, whether the Dutch government was going to also go do this with their, with their um, NGOs. And there's a very active NGO network called Partos, which is sort of, I guess, like this, uh, the sister organization of um, Interaction, um, who've, who've been working on this issue to report, and they're trying to move their members towards reporting. But there's no pressure from the Danish, sorry, from the Dutch government right now that would make this mandatory. So it's more of a decision from, as what I understand, and Leia can correct me, more from the Dutch NGO side to decide to adopt this. Um, but outside of the Dutch government having some sounds, and also there were some rumors about maybe the Swedish government moving this towards this decision, there hasn't been any concrete action. And it definitely, for the Dutch, there won't be in any of this, and not in this funding year, we've been told. Yeah, um, and just to, to follow up on that, um, I think as you all know, Interaction is part of this um, international CSO working group uh, that is looking at the application of IADI to NGOs, and, and as I'll mention, um, or I was going to mention this later, but we, I was recently in London for a meeting of that working group, and we've developed a protocol that's both aimed at what, both at NGOs that are seeking interested in publishing to Yadi as well as donor and partner countries in terms of how we'd like to how CSOs would like to be engaged um, when it comes to Yadi and we are calling on um, implementation to Yadi to be voluntary for CSOs and not have it be a precondition of funding um, obviously it's up to donors whether they um, they honor that but uh, that's that's CSOs um, position at the moment through that working group um, so we, we do have another question, um, and this is from Guy Sharak at Catholic Relief Services. Within your agencies, how was the process managed? Was a working group formed, or was the task assigned to an individual to manage? What would you advise in this regard? And again, I think that question goes to, to both Paul and, and Craig. Um, I can let me, let me, this uh, one, I guess, yes, since Paul took it. Oh, yours, Craig. <laughs> no, it's okay. Go ahead. Uh, very briefly, um, I definitely recommend some kind of working group just because of the issues uh, around being cross-functional. Um, so I think you definitely need uh, a working group of different representatives, uh, but also to just to share the workload because it tends to be more than you think. Craig, did you fit? Um, did Transparency yeah, this International? Is Craig here. Um, Go ahead. Yeah, from Transparency International side, yeah, we um, we took it. What I mentioned in the presentation, just to underscore that again. Um, so we, TI was part of the steer, has been part of the steering committee, and we continue from IATI. And one of the things that was learned, that was shared from other donors, you know, who are these, you know, large operations was that having a cross country, a cross cutting team put together from different units was the best way to have some success and to keep it moving and also to have the political will um, and buy-in at the top to, to get it going and to follow through. So one of the things that we try to do is follow that model. So I see I work I work on policy side. I don't work on technical side um, and more about how like the, the the concerns. I also work with Leia on this I international a steering, um, sorry, working group on uh, IATI for CSOs. So this is stuff I've been working on, but I'm not the tech on the technical front. And so I've been helping feed in the policy discussions to the technical people and the technical people telling me, or in the financial, what's possible. And the other thing that was useful, we got our communications and web team people involved. So they understood what we were doing, and they could then understand how to put this information up on our site. and where how it would fit into our broader, as I mentioned, accountability and transparency principles and, and what we're providing on in terms of information. And also be prepared for questions and put together um, background information just in case you know someone comes back to you with information that they want to know about your data or, as Paul mentioned, um, you know someone picking it up and distorting the information and, and you need to be prepared for that. So that was what was important to get communications involved as well. Great. Um, I actually have a have a question um, 
about whether you think your organizations would have published it Yadi absent the requirement from DFID. Um, you want me to take this, Paul? Or? Yes, you go first, Craig. Okay, you leave me the hard ones, I see. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so to be, I'll be frank here. Um, so I mentioned that TI was involved in the steering committee from the beginning, so it was always on our radar. Um, it's something that we had talked about with other CSOs, platforms that were working on aid effectiveness, about uh, bringing the standard into us. It's something the steering committee had um, had made known that they were interested in doing this at some point about having more CSOs back it and, and, and adhere to it. So it was something that we definitely were thinking about and how we could do it. Um, and so it was already it was already in a policy discussion at a high level within TI, but I would say that the decision by DFID to make it a mandatory clause in the agreement um, for, for accessing funds helped precipitate a, a quicker response. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think there's, now there's things that are good and bad about this. I think that one of the things that we now see with the CSO working group um, and also within broader discussions of CSOs is that there's, no, there's never been a resistance to the standard. It's about, well, how do we make this meaningful for us and own it? And because this was originally a donor process. So I think that there is some benefits by by having CSOs take control of the agenda and, and applying the standard because the idea is at the end of the day is that the information is meaningful and useful and by using a common standard that helps to, to create a way to compare information across different sources and, and look at it and get to a very micro level of data is very powerful and strong. So I, that to kind of balance out the issue that I think that we were already on the train to moving it but it really sped it up. By DFID, but I think that, that this really needs to, in the future, I think it would be beneficial that CSOs is, um, take control of the agenda first and move it forward on their, you know, at their pace. Great. Thanks, Craig. Paul, did you want to add anything? Did you want me to add um, anything? Yeah. Let me just say that I think similar position in that it was on our radar. The thing about the project is that it's a project where the immediate risks are quite obvious, uh, whereas the benefits are, are long term. So uh, I think having some kind of deadline and some kind of external pressure just helps the kind of internal uh, mechanisms uh, focus on the issue. So for me, it was actually helpful to have the external DFID requirement. And the other thing I was going to say was just uh, the IRT information becomes just incredibly more valuable uh, when you get a critical mass of actors within it. So for me in the UK, having DFID put that little bit of additional pressure uh, for me is kind of quite a beneficial thing because suddenly uh, you know, we'll, we'll get a kind of critical mass of at least UK NGOs who are interested and focused on the issue. Great, thanks. Paul, actually another question for you um, from Simon Early at Plan International. Uh, for for your organization, what's the total expenditure and total number of projects disclosed, and how does this compare to total expenditure at Oxfam GB? Yeah, I was actually going to uh, I was actually going to try and say that in my presentation, and then I realised I didn't have the number on me. But it's it's uh, a number of hundreds, so it's around about a thousand projects that we have in total. Some of which we have excluded for security. At the moment, our exclusion level is still quite high, so I think it's about 20%. Um, so it's probably six or 700, just to give you an idea of the scale. Uh, what we don't do is we don't publish in this format details of all the expenditure that we incur that is not within a program or a project. So, you know, what uh, in terms of our fundraising or in UK we have a big shops network so it definitely doesn't cover all our expenditure and again I don't have the number on me but I think it's probably around 50% of our total expenditure is included in this. Great, thank you. Um, I'll pose one last question unless um, some of our audience members have, have a question. Uh, but I, one thing that that 
I've heard a lot is um, talk of open information policies um, or, or access to information policies in the case of Transparency International. Are these policies that your organizations had in place before they implemented EADI or was the development of these policies spurred by, by the process of publishing to EADI? And again, that question is for, for both of you. Okay, this is uh, Paul here. So, uh, yeah, we had a policy before, um, and we revised it kind of last year to incorporate a bit more of IRT, uh, but also some other changes. Great, thanks. And Craig did. Um, this is Craig here from TI. So, yeah, so from TI side, um, we actually are in the process of revising our disclosure policy right now, or, or let's say our access information policy, um, and that is going to take. That will be informed by the IATI process now, um, and then our broader information disclosures. There was already a lot of momentum happening. It's also by the nature of our organization that you know to make sure we're being more transparent and accountable when putting information out there. And uh, with the site we launched, which had, which predated the. IATI adhere, adhesion, this was already something that we had discussed. So I think that it fit really well in line, like it's sort of um, at a good good timing. And as I said, it will ha affect our, our revision of our um, disclosure policy. Great. Thank you. Um, well, thanks both to, to, to both of you very much for these presentations. I hope it's been helpful for those of you looking at um, at the standard and whether this is something you might want to apply in your own organizations. Um, Paul and Craig, you're, of course, welcome to stay. I'm going to turn it over to Linda Raftery at, at Plan International USA, one of our members, um, to talk about their thinking on Yachty. So you can stay or if you need to go, um, just thanks very much again. Just to say thanks so much for inviting me. This is Paul. I have to have to leave, but enjoy. Thanks, Paul. So Linda, I'm um, just making you the, the presenter right now um, and turn it over to you. I need to unmute you as well. So there you go. All right. So can you hear me okay? I can. Okay, great. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, Plan US's experience, um, but starting off, we're actually um, in process of complying. Our office in the UK is further along than we are, so we've been learning quite a lot from them. Um, okay, it says screen sharing is paused. Okay. I can, can see, see it? yes, I can yeah. see your screen. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so our structure is perhaps similar to Transparency International in that we have a lot of different offices in different countries um, that have their own structure and their own reporting processes and, and all of that. Um, we have headquarters in the UK um, and then our Plan UK office, as I mentioned, is receiving funds from DFID, so they're also in the process of complying. Um, so having said that, um, my position within Plan is, is um, ICT for development, but I've been looking quite a bit at IATI just because um, because there is a technology component to it, but I'm not the you know, the person who's working on our Linda. I think we lost you. Linda, I think you might be on, on mute on your side. And it's part of our, um, our sort of ethos as an organization. We, we care a lot about transparency and accountability, and so it will be something that we'll go forward with um, as Plan US. Um, and we're pretty sure that the rest of the organization is also um, going to go along with it um, along the way. So we're basing our process on the Plan UK's um, process, and we've been using a lot of the materials that they've already put together, for example, to inform their management team, um, to inform their board. Um, and we've heard about the open information policy. We had one that has been developed at our headquarters, which then our UK office adapted you know, to include EADI into it. And then I'll take that, I'll adapt that for the US um, situation, and that's how we've been learning 
internally about how to how to go about it. Um, so we're in the process of putting together a cross organizational team, um, and one of the main reasons for that is to identify concerns that other teams might have, are whether it's accounting or um, compliance or communications or PR or you know, program or whoever, uh, we want to make sure everyone is bought in and that everyone's been able to raise any concerns or cautions that they might, um, that they might have. So one thing we're thinking of doing is, is pulling um, information with one grant just, um, and sort of testing it to see what it would look like. And there is a software that we could use. It's called Open Aid Register. And you can kind of play around with that. It's more, more for smaller organizations, but we're thinking of putting one of our grants into that system to see what the published information would look like. And then taking a look at that and making sure we're comfortable um, with everything that we're publishing and the way that it's looking um, once it's published. Um, and then we'll review that, adjust it. We would probably be complying first on our USAID grants um, and any large foundation grants that we have or multinational. Um, and we're thinking of setting a threshold amount in terms of any large private donations that we have uh, because we don't want to start off trying to, you know, do it do EOD compliance for every thousand dollars that that comes in from an individual donor. So, so I think as as both um, Transparency International and Oxfam said, it'll be a, a, a step by step process, and we'll gradually be complying as we get our systems together. Um, another issue that we're looking at is how do we coordinate with the global organization um, and understanding what um, what might be required from our country offices um, in terms of being able to you sort of follow the, follow the accountability trail and what makes the most sense and um, in what type of information, additional information we might be needing from country offices. We also want to make sure that we're being consistent across the organization. So how would we be defining um, you know, activities and projects? We would like to make sure that's consistent in Plan UK and Plan Netherlands and Plan US and across the organization. So we're talking with our other offices and trying to to define some of those things along the way as well. Um, we're also in the process of updating a lot of our internal financial systems, um, and so we're hoping at some point that um, EADI information and compliance, for the most part, would, would be automated, at least the financial piece of it, and hopefully other bits of it. So um, what are some of the concerns that, that you know, we've seen, whether it's, you know, talking with other organizations or talking with staff um, at our UK office or talking with staff at our Plan US office. Um, you know, I think the main concern that comes up is that it's a strain on people's time and resources and do we have, you know, the staff and the time to, to put into putting this information together. Um, and I think as we also heard earlier, there's, there's not an immediate return on investment. So we need to be able to you know, see the longer term benefits of, of compliance and of greater transparency in the sector. Um, people are concerned about program resources being taken away from programs going into administrative work, um, concerned about increased overhead, um, and again that, that concern about what if something comes up that, you know, that, that we're embarrassed about or that people misinterpret and we have to alleviate public concerns or there's a PR crisis. So that's some of the, you know, concern that that people have. And so kind of flipping that to, you know, what the, again, as, as my other colleagues did, you know, what are the potential um, opportunities for it? Um, we think it's an opportunity to better manage and coordinate um, our own information as well as information among peers um, and a, a way to improve our own program planning. Um, if more of our information were, were open even across our different offices, you know, one would think we would spend less time looking for information at other offices or sending emails to request, you know, what are you doing with this or what have you done on that. Um, we also think that um, that we could use it to do some interesting visualizations to show the work that we're doing or to combine um, impact that, you know, that different organizations or different thematic um, or sectoral groups are doing. So, for example, looking at all the different work that all the different EIA compliant NGOs have done on on a particular issue could be <clears throat> could be interesting to show the public, um, and so we think we can also use data to better educate the public, both about the work that NGOs are doing, but also about um, about the way that work happens, about 
um, and just sort of use it as an educational opportunity as well with the public. Um, and one statistic I, I heard that I thought was quite interesting was that with open data, with open government data, that that data is most often used by government employees themselves, even more so than by the public. So, so I think the benefits of, of having some of this information pulled together and open um, will quite benefit people just working within the sector or within our own organizations. Um, again, there's the concern of you know being exposed or embarrassed. Um, there's concern about putting vulnerable populations or, or partners that we're working with at some type of risk. Um, there have been concerns about whether our project documentation is, is prepared or fit for public consumption. Um, some of it may have been written for an internal audience. Um, so rather than looking you know, retroactively and trying to look at all these documents that we've, that we've had, um, you know, that's probably not going to be a really good use of our time at this point. So people are, are concerned about how, will we, you know, how would we look back at all this um, documentation that we have and, and prepare it or get it ready for publication. Um, so that's been another, another concern. Um, and then uh, there's a question about whether um, increased transparency might create fear of failure amongst you know, staff or partners um, or amongst you know, our, ourselves or in individuals and that you know, will people start trying to hide things so that, um, so that it doesn't come out or it's not published publicly. Um, so sort of to alleviate that one, we're really trying to give a message that we do actually have more control than we think um, over what gets published. Um, organizations can identify exclusions and that comes out in the open information policy. Those can be put out to protect any type of vulnerable population um, or a partner that, you know, that we don't feel um, should be, you know, openly named or, or openly identified. Um, another point is that much of what has what is going to be published has already been published. Um, at least the very first rounds of data that, that most people, most organizations would be publishing is, is already public. Um, so it's just not easily shareable. So that's sort of another way to alleviate some of the concerns. And compliance can be gradual um, as an organization is ready. Um, and you can not comply with certain data sets at this point and then get yourself ready over the next couple of years so that you can comply with that when, when the organization is ready. Um, and we can also adjust our internal processes. Um, I think one thing we'll need to look at are our partner agreements as well because um, we'll need to think about who actually owns the information if we're working with a number of partners and, and make sure everyone's on board and that that's all um, legally looked at as well. And I think also working on a, a cultural change internally that, that is more open to admitting, uh, admitting mistakes or admitting failure and really trying to learn from that. Um, another concern is about losing, losing our competitive edge. Um, so for example, if, if USAID doesn't mandate compliance and some organizations or CSOs, NGOs comply and others don't, um, does that mean that some of us are more exposed than others are in terms of um, publishing information or data or, or budgets or, or things like that? Um, there are also concerns with if CSOs comply and government contractors don't comply, does that put some an, an advantage over others? Um, there are concerns that people would steal our ideas, steal our donors, steal our approaches and our partners. Um, and so there sometimes is a question about are there any real benefits of complying um, with the Yadi in that type of a scenario. And I think what the way that we're seeing it is that openness is really most likely going to be the way of the future. Um, these big data sets and, and just being more transparent is, we hope, going to be just the normal way of operating in that in the future it might just look kind of strange if, if people aren't being open about their information. Um, it's not yet clear what USAID is going to, going to do. Um, we're talking with them as well as, as other, you know, as, as Liam mentioned, Interaction is also talking with them to try and, and get a better picture of what USAID and, and the US government's um, approach is going to be. Um, we understand it's going to be through the dashboard that, that's already there. Um, there's a hope that IATI can replace some of the other reporting mechanisms um, and actually reduce some of some of the burden. We don't know if that's going to happen yet, but we're hoping. Um, we also think that peer pressure and public pressure would be important in terms of, of donors and the public really starting to want to know more about how NGOs are operating in the current climate with 
with budgets being questioned and all that, it also might be wise for us to be more open about what we're doing. Um, and there's talk about creating a five-star EADI rating um, or incorporating EADI into some of the other charity rating systems like Charity Navigator. So we think that might also put a little pressure on, um, on NGOs and, and others to comply with EADI. And then sort of the last um, major point, I guess, is, is whether EADI is just what we might call upward accountability. Are we just reporting up to donors? Um, or is there, is there a way for communities and beneficiaries and, and others, um, you know, country governments to validate or contest the information that we're publishing in EADI? And how is that going to happen? Are we linking EADI in with other complaints mechanisms that exist? Um, is it useful to stakeholders other than donors and, and potentially CSOs? Um, and does it take away from some of the some of the other ways that um, the Freedom of Information Act and, and things like that? Are we then sort of deciding as as a organization we're going to publish this information and now we've published everything and now we're transparent, or is there still space for um, you know for the public or for the media to ask us particular questions? Um, more related to things that they want to know rather than things that we've decided we want to publish. Um, so in terms of VASP, I think it, it really still needs some work. Um, there needs to be more work uh, with journalists and, and others around open data in general um, and with civil society in, in some of the countries where we work so that they can also access and, and be better prepared to really interpret and understand the data that's being published. Um, one of the pros in this area is if, if we as NGOs are more transparent, we think we might have moral ground to push governments and corporations to be more transparent. But we really need to continue to, to push on this front. So regardless of the concerns, um, you know, we think EADI can still support an organization's values of transparency and accountability, can help with internal coordination, external coordination, better resource allocation and program design, public education on how aid works, um, collective learning across of our, our, all of our different agencies, and hopefully, eventually, um, it can offer different stakeholders better access to information and, and help them pressure others for greater accountability and, and aid effectiveness. So that's um, what I can share from, from our perspective at PLAN. And our, our CEO, Tessie, is, is here listening in, too, so she can also offer some perspective on, on what we're thinking at PLAN. Thanks, Linda. Um, and I think you you brought up um, a lot of good points and some additional points that maybe didn't come through in the in the other presentations. Um, the issue of, of upward versus downward accountability, I think, is one CSOs have been very concerned about and is something that um, came up in the IADI CSO working group meetings recently. Um, and also that one of the, you know, viewing IADI as as having more moral ground for advocating for greater transparency among other actors is, is another point um, to keep in mind. Uh, given that Tessie is on the line, and Tessie, I'm going to unmute you now, um, I'd just be curious. Really curious. Oh, um, I have an echo, so I'll unmute you when, when I'm done talking. But I'd be curious about why, given, you know, the the great number of transparency and accountability initiatives out there for CSOs. Why did um, PLAN decide that it would be important to comply with Yachty in particular, if you wouldn't mind taking that question? Um, yeah, thanks. And this has been uh, very interesting for me to uh, listen in on. So I uh, very much appreciate the information that's been handed out here. Um, I, I mean, it, you're, you're right. So there are a variety of things, and this is one of several things that we're doing. And, and uh, so it's not the only thing that we're doing around, you know, accountability. But it seemed um, that, uh, you know, it seemed to us, and, and as Linda said, you know, irrespective of what USA, the U.S. government requires, um, it, it seemed like a good thing to add to the number of initiatives that we were implementing in terms of, of enhancing our own, you know, accountability that includes things like, you know, improving um, the way that we monitor and evaluate projects, how we report on them, and so on. And so this is not the only thing that we're doing. It's one of, it's one of several things that we're doing. I'm also hoping, um, 
you know, as, as Linda said, so we're a federation. The U.S. is just one of, um, you know, another, you know, 69 offices that, that Plan International has. Um, and I think these types of initiatives are very useful in terms not just of, you know, enhancing how we communicate uh, with, the ex with external donors and the, the public, um, but with, with each other. And, um, and I think, again, because it was started by the, the, it's been started by the UK, we are, you know, sort of following them on this and, and adapting what, what they're doing. Uh, and talking um, throughout the the rest of the federation about you know adopting the IATI standards, we, we think that this is you know one one way of unifying um, you know a lot of our you know sort of internal uh, reporting and improving how we you know manage uh, information and, and learn from each other. So so there there are benefits internally to the to the organization um, as well. And and I, I guess the the final thing I'll say is in, in this and other things. Um, you know, this trend of, of you know, more transparent re, uh, reporting and, and so on um, is, is, is here to stay and uh, we can either, you know, eventually comply or try to get ahead of it. So in this as in other things, we're, we're just trying to stay ahead. Great. Thanks very Thank much, Tessie. Very much, Tessie. Uh, I've just muted you again because unfortunately otherwise um, people will hear me twice, uh, but if you have anything else you'd like to add, just um, raise your hand or just send me a note and I can unmute you again. Um, I think this might have, this question might have been answered, um, but we did get a question about who within PLAN is, is driving this agenda. Obviously there seems to be a lot of senior level support, um, but, but Linda, is, is this coming out of the is is your office the ICT for development group or technology staff in at plan um, really taking the lead on this or are other parts of the organization engaged sure um, I I report straight um, directly into Tessie so I think I may have been the person that's been sort of jumping around about it the most just because <laughs> I learned about it quite a while ago and I've been quite interested and I've just been following it um, through some of the different things that, that, I, that I read and, and different blogs that I follow. And so, um, you know, since there hasn't been a whole lot of information and, um, and our UK office was quite further along, um, you know, I've been sort of the link in with the UK office trying to learn more about what they're doing um, and how they're doing it and then bringing that information back into our senior management team. And Tessie's been very supportive, which I think is, is one piece that's really critical, is to have supportive leadership in terms of getting something like this um, worked out. We also have been in communication with different teams, so our headquarters is also quite interested in looking at how they can support over time. Um, the way we're structured is that, that our headquarters, and Simon Early is, is on the call as well from our headquarters um, right now, so they're more linked in with with um, compliance issues through through our country offices, so for us it's really important that um, you know that that our headquarters and our country offices are also moving along in the same you know in the same process, um, and that there's buy-in from all those different levels. So it's really the beginning. If if you ask me honestly, it's really sort of the beginning in terms of EADI. Um, I'm looking at EADI right now. The team that we're forming within the U.S. office would have people from compliance, probably someone from communications, someone who's looking at um, our USAID programs. Um, eventually, we would be looking at people from our marketing team um, and from our donor services teams, from our major giving teams. So again, I think it really has to be a cross-organizational cross um, effort just because it really does touch on pretty much every piece of, of our operations, um, not only in the U.S., but, but because of the way we work as a global organization, it's really going to end up touching on everyone. So um, I guess to be more specific about the question, you know, it's not being driven from the ICT part. It's being driven um, from the executive office, um, which is where I sit and, and I report into Tessie. Great. Thanks, Linda. Um, another question that may be that maybe you could um, answer given your conversations with uh, 
USAID, and, and I might add, add to that to the extent I can, is uh, what is USAID's level of interest in this? If they choose to go this route of greater openness, is it probable that they will choose the Audi as the platform, or are there alternatives? And you, as you said, you may know more in detail. Um, what I understand from having been at other meetings about this is that USAID is going to be working through the dashboard, and I don't know a whole lot about the dashboard. Um, if the, um, you might be able to explain more about that, but there's the, the dashboard that's being run, I believe, out of state department. Mm -hmm. Yeah, collaborating, coordinating with USAID, and the the general idea is to use that dashboard as um, as the link into EADI, um, and that USAID would not be mandating in the way that DFID does, um, but they might there might be some other ways that, that there might be some element of pressure, but, but that's something I think that's still really up in the air. Yeah, um, just to add to that, so the Foreign Assistance Dashboard, is it is run um, out of the State Department. Um, it's meant to be the, the place where information on what ultimately all U.S. agencies involved in foreign assistance are doing. Right now, it, it primarily captures information on USAID, the State Department, as well as the Millennium Challenge Corporation. Um, there's mostly um, financial information on there, not too much uh, project data. So it, it, it talks about you know, what sectors or what countries USAID funding is, is going to. A lot of the information is from the congressional budget justification. Um, and that is, so they've, they've devised this system of you know, what information is, is going to be collected. It aligns with the Audi quite nicely, I take it. And so the idea is that all agencies would submit information for the dashboard, and then the dashboard would publish information on behalf of the U.S. government because the commitment to publish EADI data is not just for USAID, but for all the U.S. government's um, foreign assistance efforts. Um, they've told us that they're, at, at least for now, um, that they have no um, plans to to have NGOs comply with the Audi, partly because they feel they already collect enough information from um, their implementing partners to be able to, to publish um, comprehensive information on their activities. Um, I, I'm going to unmute uh, Steve Darville from, from CDA, uh, who is one of our members. Um, who's an interaction member that's been affected by the DFID requirements, so he's kind of in a different position. Um, I don't know how many other U.S. organizations are in your place kind of lonely out here um, <laughs> trying to comply yeah. with a U.K. requirement, but if I thought it might be interesting to get your perspective on what it's been like. Yeah, well, thanks. Um, yes, we, we are in the position where we have a, a DFID grant um, which uh, requires us to produce uh, an implementation schedule next week um, and then actually begin to publish uh, by April the 1st. Um, and being on this side of the Atlantic, um, we have had to draw very heavily on um, Bond uh, and their advice. And I have to say they've been very um, helpful in that. Um, in providing advice and including us in, in those conversations, but but the, there are a couple of, of uh, I guess reflections that we we've, we've um, come up with in, in just in getting this far. Um, one is um, is the the challenge uh, or, or the risks, shall we say, in having uh, one uh, group of uh, NGOs uh, pushed by DFID and heading uh, forward and implementing this stuff, and then others, parts of the world where it's not actually happening so quickly. And there's, a, I think, a little bit of a risk of uh, creating some sort of um, two-tier system uh, here. Um, so my 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 suggestion would be that um, you know that the the, uh, the community here interaction um, uh, perhaps under the interactions tutelage needs to move together uh, move forward together on this because there are I think some real risks in having um, some uh, some NGOs some uh, uh, 
organizations um, getting their nose out in front um, and and then the other thing is 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 the obvious one of resources um, there's a uh, I think of a set amount of resources that are needed um, just to set this up and that uh, is more or less the same whether you're a, a fairly large organization like Oxfam or um, a small organization like ourselves uh, of 12, 13 people. So for, from our point of view, um, to actually get us over the next um, little hump to get the thing set up, um, it's actually going to cost us an extra uh, staff person that we're going to have to put on, um, which of course has, has funding in place. Applications. Um, I just flag one other issue that um, has sort of occurred in some of our conversations um, is that the the when we've been talking to um, different agencies that have been trying to implement IRT, we have indeed been talking to uh, people from finance sectors, uh, from uh, the, 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 the governments, the program areas, the policy areas, but it has struck us that a couple of our key constituencies um, that, that we've been talking to or we work with on a regular basis, um, the humanitarian and peace building areas of, of some of these organizations, um, they they seem very blissfully unaware of IRT. Um, and so the, 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 it seems to us that there's a conversation that's been, uh, needs to be expanded to some of those uh, sectors because when we have tried to raise it with some of these constituencies, um, there's been a number of concerns uh, raised, raised uh, about um, typically security, of course, um, but and, and there are provisions for exclusion um, from from publishing some uh, information on, on the basis of security. But some of these sectors just don't, don't seem to have been uh, engaged in this conversation at all. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Steve. Um, those are also important points to keep in mind. Um, I'm, a, I'm aware of the, of the time, so Linda, I just give, want to give you um, an opportunity to make any, any last comments that you'd like to make before I just mention a few things by way of wrap-up. Um, nope, I'm just, thanks for having me um, you know, share our experiences and, and look forward to hearing about how we can all move forward on this together as an you know, agency. Great. Thanks, Linda. Um, so we are um, close to the, to the end of our time. So I just wanted to, um, to mention a, a few things, um, if I can move my screen. First, I know that for those um, who are interested in, in implementing Yachty, a lot of the conversations have been happening in the UK. I am trying to um, build up the resources available to US NGOs that might be interested in implementing this initiative. And so if you go to the, the link at the bottom of your screen, um, you'll see a, a list of resources I'm slowly building out. And the presentations from today's webinar will be posted here as well. So that's www.interaction.org forward slash work slash transparency. Um, and then another thing is opportunities to engage. I think it's important for, for U.S. agencies to um, be involved in this conversation. As Linda said, we, we really do see a trend of pushing towards greater transparency. And so I think it would be important for NGOs to kind of define this initiative for themselves. Um, so if you're not already on um, our transparency list, you can send me an email um, and I can add you. Um, encourage you to participate in future meetings and webinars, or if you'd like a briefing on EADI at your organization, um, I'd be happy to do that as well. Uh, the EADI CSO Working Group um, has provide, is developing several products, including a background paper which has been circulated to the um, Transparency List and Aid Effectiveness Working Group. So that's that's one resource that's, that's almost finalized now. But we will be um, asking for comments on it on another product that the Yachty CSO Working Group developed, which is a protocol to 
to the EADI standard that I mentioned earlier, just putting forth CSO perspectives on, on implementation of the initiative. And then I am contacting um, several interaction members to just talk to them about how they're thinking about transparency within their organizations, not just limited to EADI. And so if you'd be willing to um, be part of, of those interviews, um, just get in touch or I might just reach out to you directly. Uh, so thanks very much everyone. You can always ask me any questions you might have about this or work on Yachty and I hope to see you at the next meeting on this. Thanks very much Linda again for your presentation. Bye everyone. Thank you. <laughs>